everyone, uh, this is Tina, and on today's episode, I'm going to be interviewing Dr. Han Ren, um, who is my guest for today, and we're going to be talking about a different piece of complex trauma that I haven't really explored very much on the podcast yet, um, which is complex trauma that stems not from uh, family, individual, like childhood abuse and neglect type stuff, um, but from larger systems of like oppression and violence. Um, and that can impact people's families and individual relationships. So it's complex, but um, the kind of trauma that stems from things like poverty and racism and other like systemic oppression that impacts people's lives. Um, but before we dive into that, I'm just going to introduce Han and let her tell you a little bit about herself. Yeah, hi, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Dr. Han Ren. I'm a licensed psychologist and licensed school psychologist in Austin, Texas. Um, I'm in private practice, and these days I mainly work with um, young adults, overthinking, overachievers, um, Asian Americans, and also healing racial trauma. Um, I take a anti-oppressive justice-oriented approach um, to all of my work, and um, I've been really interested in um, anti-racism work and the intersection of, you know, the individual with um, broader systems, um, you know, across um, all domains. Yeah, awesome, cool, well, I'm glad that you're here. Um, why don't we start with, can you just uh, tell us a little bit about what being anti-oppression means to you in the context of mental health and being a therapist? Yeah, so historically, psychology um, has always been so individually focused, um, and some of the, you know, first wave types of interventions have been, you know, more behavioral or um, psychoanalytic, where we focus on the individual and their relationships within the family system. It doesn't really take into account the greater systems in which we live, and so to be an anti-oppressive um, therapist means that you, I'm aware of the complexities of the different nested systems in which we exist. Um, so issues such as politics, such as um, workplace discrimination, um, such as access to um, healthcare and, and basic kind of human rights that can be really stunted in certain communities um, are all part of my treatment. Um, so I, I really, I think of my work as not only like activating the person's individual resilience and what they can kind of tap into with their internal coping, but also better understanding how they got to be where they are given the systems in which they live and identifying where are some of the areas that they can have maybe some agency and making some changes and shifts. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. And I, it makes sense in the context that we're not just part of our individual families were part of these like larger communities um and that really doesn't get touched on very much in a lot of mental health mm -hmm. um i had a realization about that recently even just re like uh in reference to how people with autism and adhd end up with trauma from yeah. ableism um and from society not being accepting and like accessible for people with neuro neurodivergence and that was something that i had never never thought of until recently mm -hmm. um Absolutely. So what are what are some of the main ways that um, that you have seen racial trauma show up in in people's lives and in therapy? Hmm. It's so like entrenched and embedded, like it's almost, you know, easier to answer like what are the ways that like they don't show up, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's like like, for example, you know, when people are um, like working their asses off at, you know, and, and like, I, I, you know, want to caveat this by saying like, I currently work with a very privileged high function population. Like I very much serve the worried well at this point, although a lot of my training and background have been, you know, in different communities that have been affected by you know, poverty and um, community violence. Um, but even in these like very well off, um, like, you know, individuals, you know, where they are very high functioning, um, if they hold a marginalized identity, there's often this like 
believe that they have to make up for it. They have to work harder. They have to doubly prove themselves. So a lot of this like perfectionism, people pleasing, show up in the workplace and show up in, in the ways that they interact with, with others. Um, and yet they still don't get the promotions. They still don't get the um, you know, high visibility opportunities. Um, and they are labeled, you know, things that are really predominantly used, you know, like euphemisms for racism, like right. you're antagonistic, you're um, abrasive. Um, and so, I mean, those are just some, some of the ways that it shows up, but it, it really trickles down to like every level of a person's um, yeah. functioning. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it, I would imagine things like kind of like rejection and like social alienation um, apply to that because even if you have like immediate family members that are accepting or supporting, you're going to face this like much larger sense of rejection and scrutiny and just being like devalued in the workplace or in school or those sorts of things. Yeah. And I mean, and, you know, in a, in a, effort to avoid that, there's a lot of code switching. There's a lot of, um, kind of this like proximity to whiteness that gets, um, capitalized on where people, try to assimilate to the best of their abilities because it is a key to their survival and especially if they have made it to you know like a grad school or they're in a high power position um they're you know in some ways like can be seen by their original community as like race traders because mm -hmm. they can you know walk that walk so well but it is very much rooted in a deep need for survival yeah yeah absolutely that makes a lot of sense um it, it reminds me of uh something that Gabriel Mate said that human beings have these like two inherent needs for attachment and authenticity, meaning that like we we need to like be true to ourselves. Um, and we also need to feel like connected and accepted by other people. But that if you learn that they're not compatible with each other, like I cannot be authentic and also be accepted, then there's like this just kind of deep sense of like, um, shame or not belonging or just needing to like alter and uh, like hide aspects of who you are in order to try to gain that like social acceptance. And yeah, yeah. Um, I can see that that would probably apply with like racism and the code switching that you were talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah, this desire to fit in rather than trying to find spaces where they can truly belong and be themselves. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so just off the top of my head, some of the um, some of the things that I think of when I think of oppression based complex trauma is I think of um, like growing up in poverty and not having your needs met consistently. So just mm -hmm. not knowing if you're going to have like food insecurity, um, housing insecurity, those sorts of things. Um, and then there's the racial trauma that people experience when they're targeted with racialized violence, of course, like anyone mm -hmm. who has experienced even like um, incarceration or police violence or um, other forms of just like uh racial like microaggressions and antagonism and stuff um those are those are like some of the things that are popping into my head right now do you have any other like common kind of scenarios that you see yeah um i mean uh a really interesting one that maybe is not even thought of that often as like a kind of a result of like oppressive systems is how strict um immigrant parents are or like you know parents of color are they they tend to be a very you know rigid in parenting and discipline and there's this hierarchy which is you know depending on the culture is like very much rooted in culture but in terms of you know american society a lot of it is so their kids can like get in line and act right and be accepted by the broader community and so they tend to use you know harsher disciplinary um measures which you know can lead to then the complex trauma um, from on that line, like a more like individual perspective, but it's yeah. really shaped by the systems in which um, they are also trying to survive and live and like build a generation of opportunity for their for their offspring, for their kids. Yeah. Do you see that as like a result of intergenerational trauma kind of where there are these like mm -hmm. messages passed down of, you know, danger and survival and that kind of like shapes the family culture and the parenting approach? Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely um, a big part of it. Um, and then also just that like, you know, if 
you have a kid who's like acting out and they go to school and they're acting that way. If, if it's a white kid, it's like, oh, what a class clown. But if it's a black kid, you know, they might be kicked out of class and, you know, sent down the school to prison pipeline. Right. So, you know, a lot of it is, is like this deep reverence for authority and respect is, is very much rooted in survival, you know, but it also we know how like development works in, in youth, like, you know, there's the tendency to rebel against that. And, and so, you know, it kind of takes on um, some different pathways as, as kids age. But I think for a lot of families, it's like, you know, don't be like me or be like me and see what I had to do to really fit in in order to have the success that I do. Yeah. Yeah. So almost out of a desire to like protect their kids Mm, from the, like uh, the various forms of like violence that are in the world. Um, the parenting can be more like harshly disciplinary or Mm -hmm. rigid or maybe setting like really high standards for behavior and achievement. Yeah. Yeah, And I mean, I think it shows up, you know, a little bit differently depending on like the cultural background of each family. But, you know, I think about like had talks with my, you know, white friends who are like, oh, I just don't want to like have to explain to my children what police brutality is like. (laughs) five is so young. And, and I, it, you know, it kind of makes me scoff because I'm like, do you know at what age like black parents have to explain this is what you do when the cops stop you? And this is how you respond to authority if you want to be alive. Yeah. I mean, it's young, you yeah. know, it's like three, four. Yeah. And then that message is like repeatedly honed in. And it's like, but that's like a privilege that a lot of families don't even think about. They're like, I just want to protect their innocence. But right. you know, it's not, innocence yeah for a lot of families and I mean I'm thinking for like Asians like you know East Asians especially with the model minority myth so much of our like place at the table has come from our ability to be like helpful and um you know useful to like the dominant culture and the the dominant population yeah and so you know growing up like my parents were like if you know the answer make sure you tell them and then you know be extra helpful and like I always thought growing up when people would say like oh Han would know the answer I'd be like yeah like I feel so proud of myself like not even realizing that this was like such a microaggression and like really not (laughs) an okay thing to be um growing up with but it was a source of pride um, and so I think of like survival showing up in different ways like that um, for families of color. Children. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, kind of like a, a high emphasis placed on achievement in these different ways to try mm-hmm. to be like worthy and valued in the culture. Yeah, or alive, you know, right. if, if it's you know, depending on your culture. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Um, so Uh, What do you think are some of the issues that people of marginalized identities face when they're trying to seek mental health care or they're trying Mm -hmm. to get into therapy? Um, I think this idea of being a justice oriented therapist is relatively new. Um, You know, just thinking back to what I learned in grad school, like, you know, my program was a scientist practitioner model and like most programs were, or they were more like research based. And like now there's like scientist practitioner advocate models. This idea of advocacy is relatively new when it comes to, you know, how it's taught um, in academic programs. Um, And so like, I was taught like, okay, to be a good therapist, you have to be a completely blank slate. You have to, you know, protect these boundaries that are very much like, you know, set in stone. And a lot of that is not safe for people of color because if a person of color asks the therapist like, well, are you a Trump supporter? And the, you know, the therapist is like, well, I, you know, I'm so curious of why you asked me that. And you know, <laughs> how does this apply to your care? You right. know, like that's not something that makes a person who lives in a brown body feel safe. Like, right. it's like, cause if you truly believe something that is so antithetical to my safety and existence, then right. even if you're a great therapist who knows all of these great skills, your like personal beliefs are going to sneak in. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so how can like, there be a sense of like yeah. safety in the therapeutic relationship? If you don't know if yes. this person is like voting against your right to exist. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, I mean, it also shows up in like, you know, like the white liberal, like performatively woke 
uh, type as well. Like that's, you know, and you know, I'm in Austin. So I think <laughs> that's a great way to describe so much of like, you know, our, our population here, people are very well-meaning. They vote blue, they compost, they drink their kombucha. And they're like, <laughs> very like, you know, they want to do the right thing, but the, they haven't been really challenged in like, Hey, when you say these things off the cuff, it is really harmful. And so when they are challenged, like their fragility comes out, like, oh, none of my clients have ever said that I was racist. And, you know, guess what? Your clients do not um, consent to be used to uphold your reputation. Right. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of these, like, it's, it's more subtle, but in some ways it's more damaging when, when people don't know what they don't know, but they're also so firmly attached that they don't need to know those elements. Yeah. Um, and they use like their own experiences rather than like trying to learn and um, be curious and, you know, proactive about learning about the experiences of their clients. Yeah. 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 Does that um does that like lack of transparency kind of shift in like justice oriented therapy where instead of it being like, oh, if you ask me about my political beliefs, I'm going to set up a boundary. There's more mm -hmm. of an understanding that like, oh, well, politics are actually, you know, relevant to the safety and the relationship and maybe more like open dialogue about that in therapy. Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, therapy is inherently political because, you know, it talks about a person's wellness and like your right to exist is absolutely related to your wellness. Um, and, you know, I think justice oriented therapists really um, challenge this like power differential that exists in more like traditional therapy relationships, you know, obviously like judicious use of self-disclosure, you're not going to try to, you know, spend the hour like on your own stuff. Yeah. Um, but there is more, like awareness and acceptance of like self-disclosure is part of what builds a relationship and is part of what uh, facilitates healing that like, hey, this person, you know, either they've like been there and they get it from that perspective, or even if they haven't been there, they can recognize what they don't know. And then they can be proactive and try to learn what they don't know and fill in the gaps. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what oppression or anti-oppression and justice oriented therapy looks like in practice for you? Like how, how does that kind of look different from maybe more standard apolitical therapy? Yeah, you know, so for example, like um, you know, this actually happened like in a session last week where a client was very concerned about like, you know, being the only woman of color in her workplace. She was like, I, do I talk about race too much? Like, I'm afraid that I'm, you know, token, like not tokenizing like herself, but she was afraid that she was like being that like one, like, oh, but you know, as a person of color, like, um, and like making other people feel uncomfortable. And I think like, you know, a, a more like apolitical traditional stance was like, well, how do you like, um, work on your communication skills or like what is there any like signals from the people around you that you are saying anything that's off-putting and um you know like challenge that belief right like cbt that away what, right. where where do you get the evidence for that whereas for a more you know my response was like what would it be like to take up more space and embody your body which is a body of color and how would things feel different if you didn't have to distill yourself down for white comfort? Yeah, yeah. And I just said it just like that. And like, that would be highly uncomfortable <laughs> for, I think, a lot of people. But I think for, you know, a lot of clients of color, it's really affirming and refreshing. Yeah, a breath of um, fresh air, I think. Yeah. And, you know, and clearly not everyone's ready or like there. Um, and I don't really hide that this is how I try to live my life. And this is how I, um, you know, like this is where I am in my own racial journey. And I will yeah. even say like, okay, like this is, I'm talking to you like as an Asian woman, human versus like, okay, this is more of like a therapeutic approach. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. I feel like there's almost an element of like gaslighting sometimes in traditional mm -hmm. therapy when people are bringing up concerns like that about, you know, a legitimate like sense of um danger or social oppression or like whatever they're experiencing and therapists kind of use that like cbt like cognitive mm -hmm. behavioral therapy in a way approach where it's like oh well you know maybe, why are you feeling anxious about that and you know those sorts of things instead of validating the the reality 
of what people are perceiving and yeah, responding yeah. to. Yeah, like you can't like progressive muscle relaxation your way out of that, you know? <laughs> like that's not um that's not like something that's a problem with the individual that's something right. that's a problem with the system and quite frankly it's not safe to like try to fool your nervous system be like i'm safe here and i can like just you know be my most relaxed authentic self when you will actually be persecuted or punished in right. subtle ways it's not the same ways as it was historically but it's like you're not going to get invited to that happy hour or you know maybe you're going to have more hoops to jump through for that promotion or right. whatever else um it's like legitimately not safe yeah yeah I feel like some of it comes down to just this tendency in psychology to like individualize everything and just kind of only view like anyone who is struggling in any way it's an individual issue that they need to resolve mm -hmm. and I think that's something that is being challenged more recently um in a lot of ways like even I think of the way that like um family systems therapy you know helps us understand that like a kid isn't just by themselves a kid they're part of this mm -hmm. system yeah. and if the family is unwell like that's going to show up in the kid's mental health yeah. um but it, yeah it seems like that awareness is really like missing a lot of the times when it comes to like those larger social structures and when someone is just being kind of like pathologized mm -hmm. for their responses to trauma or their awareness of racism or whatever it's yeah. really harmful and like entire family systems are pathologized you know you know and like we think we see this a lot with like collectivist orientations when a lot of you know immigrant cultures where they they's like well how come you're living with your family you know aren't you shouldn't you be like leaving the nest now like I grew up with both my grandparents living in the same house as me for several years and it was just you know what was done and it wasn't even like my parents couldn't leave the nest they were taking care of their parents and that yeah. was like part of their duty as you know the, the children to like bring their parents to the united states and like take care of them yeah. and enmeshment was not something that um really like sparked that it was it was just what was culturally expected yeah no I, I saw that a lot because i'm in new mexico right now and so the population here is mostly native american and hispanic mm -hmm. and that was most of the population at the place that i did therapy a while back and um one thing that i noticed was that there were a lot of circumstances where yeah families would be like like the kids would still be like sleeping in the same room as their parents yeah. mm -hmm. or um there would just kind of be different norms for like parenting and yeah. then those parenting or family decisions would often be not necessarily by like the therapist that I worked with they were they were pretty cool but um mm -hmm. like I could I could sense and listen to like larger perspectives on those things where I could see them being pathologized where it's like yeah there's this assumption that the parent and the kid are enmeshed or there's bad mm -hmm. boundaries or whatever um which just seems like yeah it could, it could be stemming from just like cultural ignorance and just kind of projecting white western culture as like the correct way to be a family yeah I mean something as as like common um as like co-sleeping you know like more universally or globally like co-sleeping is very much the norm in most societies except for ours um you know and like yes SIDS is real and there's you know there's dangers to it if it's not done like yeah. with mindfulness um but to like just with like a broad brush stroke to say that oh that is just like you're, you're putting your kid at risk you're gonna kill your kid if you co-sleep is like very much damaging and like disrespectful to you know how a lot of global societies operate yeah yeah um can you can you speak a little bit to the shift in language from like cultural competency to cultural mm -hmm. humility mm -hmm. humility because that's something that i've been hearing a lot more about recently yeah i mean the idea that anyone can be cultural cult culturally competent is a fallacy because you cannot know and be competent in every single culture that exists in the world and so to think it's it just it's so reductionistic that like okay i just learn like a few things about like you know um how certain certain cultures like operate and then like i've had a few clients of color here and there and now i'm culturally competent you know and i think a lot of people like to use that label as a shield from having to do deeper work and so you know the the vernacular but also just sort of like the mental you know, approach and the shift in how um culture is talked about in therapy and um you know in practice is like how can you be culturally affirming where you can say like, i don't i don't know everything about this but thank you for 
you know, sharing this and I'm going to go do my own research so that your client's not the one who has to educate you. Right. You know, how can you approach your lack of knowledge with that humility um, and admit when you don't know something? Yeah. Um, and, you know, culturally grounded, culturally um, affirming. Yeah, those are those are more like preferred terms because it really highlights um, the learning process, the growth yeah. curve. Yeah, culturally competent almost seems like arrogant. Like, really? <laughs> how yeah. do you get to like give yourself that label, right? Absolutely. And I mean, and I see it a lot with like, you know, in like consultation groups or um, when people talk about their clients, they're like, well, they did this thing, but I think it's cultural, you know, it's almost <laughs> like the word that they use is like a, this like broad, like explain away anything I don't understand, right. which like, you know, at least they're not saying like, oh, this is pathological. Um, so it's a step, but it's like, you know, a lot of people think like, well, I can stop there. I recognize that it was cultural. And so then I don't need to like be curious. Go any about deeper than it. that. Or, yeah. I can just like leave it there. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really doing everybody a huge disservice. Yeah. I mean, there's so much cultural variation, even within mm -hmm. like certain identity groups. It seems like it's also very homogenizing, like to yes. kind of be like, yes. oh, I'm confident. Like I'm culturally competent. I mean, even working with um, Native American families in New Mexico, like there's so many different tribes. There's so many yeah. different like cultural backgrounds that people come from um even if you learn a lot about one specific culture like i i mean i would imagine the only culture that you can truly be like competent in is your own you know because that's the one that you like know the best what do, what do you mm -hmm. think about that i mean i think even then right like no no culture is a monolith i would say yeah. like the times that i have stuck my foot in my mouth the most in therapy <laughs> was when i made an assumption about the um, background or dynamics um of other like chinese american immigrants because i'm like oh yeah i know you like i i have that's similar me. experiences that's yeah. me but then it's like no no like even then there's so much variability yeah um and so i think it's it's really like yeah, like to hold that curiosity, no matter who you are and who you're serving, um, is essential. Yeah, yeah. Um, what would be your advice to people who want to seek out a um, anti-oppressive and like justice oriented therapist or are looking for that kind of care and therapy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, definitely interview your therapist, you know, ask them like what their perspectives are on systemic oppression on mental health and see what they have to say. Um, a lot of times this question throws many therapists off and they, they don't have a good answer. Um, ask them how they are engaging in their own anti-racism work. You know, what are they doing? Who, you know, who are they reading? Um, are they doing things beyond reading? Um, ask them where they are in their own identity work because we cannot be healers and um, you know, serve others if we don't do our own work. We can only take people as far as we've been able to excavate ourselves. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then ask them like, you know, what is your experience in working with my particular, um, you know, culture? Um, I think having a therapist of color is helpful, but it's not always a guarantee. Like, you know, there's plenty of white adjacent therapists of color who <laughs> haven't done their own work and, yeah. and there's also like a lot of really um you know like justice oriented anti-racist white therapists who have done you know layers and layers of work so um it's not a default like assumption but i think interviewing your therapist and um just making sure that you feel comfortable with the way that they're giving their responses not just the content of their responses but you know how how relaxed are they how relational are they that that gives a good clue on like how much work that they've done with their own identity and where yeah. they are with fragility yeah i would imagine like a therapist being able to admit that they don't know something is like a green flag because it's like yeah. okay you can admit it like um not I've, I've had plenty of therapists in my life who i really got the sense from them that they put themselves in this very like authoritative mm -hmm. position and you can kind of like sense that of like you're the therapist and i'm the client and like you're the one that's right and kind of gets like the final say on things and mm -hmm. so that's i i've differential yeah yeah, yeah. I, I found that like yeah making sure that a therapist is able to like admit when they're wrong 
wrong and that the client feels empowered to like disagree or you know assert their opinions or those sorts of things are really important yeah this is something that i want to like put a lot of focus on because Mm -hmm. i've kind of like picked my focus as being cptsd Mm -hmm. um and um i feel like yeah when you look up cptsd or you're doing reading about it like the majority of what you find about it is very focused on like individual family systems childhood trauma and and those sorts Mm -hmm. of things Mm -hmm. um so i think it's really important like especially with trauma work of any kind to like understand and tie in um systemic and like racial trauma or Mm -hmm. there's like this huge chunk of people's experience that's just missing yeah and like and and the intersectionality of that you know like so much of this like community racial trauma then like creates stressed traumatized parents which then you know they go and raise children in this scarcity fear-based way which produces attachment wounds yeah yeah um so is that something that you've seen a lot with because you said that you work a lot with clients who are kind of like mm-hmm. perfectionist like yeah. high achieving yeah like um, the fawners yeah 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 let's talk about so um just as like a quick review for anyone who didn't like hear my episode or isn't familiar with the terminology fawning is the trauma response where you try to seek safety by people pleasing and accommodating and kind of keeping the people around you happy it often comes with like you know kind of hyper vigilance of being like highly attuned to other people's responses and um yeah so how do you see like fawning um emerge from those kind of like uh intergenerational like trauma wounds yeah um i mean every immigration story is a trauma story because you cannot leave your people your land your culture your food your language your everything in hopes of a better life and have that not be traumatic even if you have like a lot of privilege i mean i guess if you like go to like london for a year and you like have this bomb flap even then like that's still kind of traumatic you know but like when we think about like the majority of immigration stories to the U.S. and like what brought people here, it's it's a trauma story. Yeah. Um. And so as a result, like you know, our our parents are trying to raise children who will be adaptable, who will assimilate, who will be able to survive in this new land. And so some of them, you know, have taken it to this extreme where they don't even teach their children their native tongue mm. because they want them to be accepted by Western ideals. They want them to be Americanized. And so with that, like message coming from home and then like, you know, the kid goes to school and they stick out, you know, if it's not a community where there's a lot of people who look like them, um, they learn that, okay, I need to hide my like shrimp chips and bring my Lay's potato chips, you know, like (laughs) simple things like that. Or like, um, you know, when I use that word, like people don't know what I'm talking about. So I'm going to use this other word. Um, And, you know, I'm not going to invite people over to my house because it smells funny or, you know, like all of these things that, that kids learn as necessary elements of their um, of their identity, of their survival. Um, and then like, it also gets really reinforced by society, you know, like the capitalist society very much like rewards good grades and raising your hand and knowing the answer. And so then like, you know, um, growing up in that, that like dynamic teaches a person like in order for me to, um, be loved, I have to achieve and I have to fit in. So then, you know, achievement and outcomes become very tied to a person's identity and they can't ever really escape that because, you know, after they go to like high school, they go to like a good college and there's all of that cutthroatness there. And then they go to like a fortune 500 company and there's all of the, you know, competition and achievement as identity stuff there. Yeah. Um, And it's, miserable you know and and people come to me when they're in their like late 20s early 30s and they're like like burnt out burnt out yes this is not sustainable I can't live like this
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's almost like the, um, I can see like the assimilation and the fawning like really going together Mm because it's like, that's kind of like what assimilating is in a certain sense is like needing to read everyone else's moods, everyone else's responses, what they want from you, and then just trying Mm -hmm. to like become what is wanted of you to like gain that that safety and acceptance. But Mm -hmm. instead of happening on just like an individual level of like, oh, I'm, you know, I fawn with my partner or whatever. It's like you're fawning with your entire community world yeah your entire world yeah yeah Yeah. and I mean it's really fascinating because you also see like entire groups of like people of color who you know do that together and then they kind of reinforce each other but then they they can like be very kind of encapsulated because they're like well I, I hang out with other people who look like me so like I'm not like proximity to whiteness but then like the ideals that they really you know veer towards tend to be more like western ideals and I mean maybe that's just the way that I use to explain like the big groups like people of color who support Trump and who are like (laughs) very conservative and they're like in their um you know yeah politics like just Um, just finding people who have the same race or ethnicity as you doesn't mean that you're necessarily finding people who share the same like values or will help you um work through like cultural trauma if that's what you're right 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 yeah Yeah, like who are like kind of you know attuned to the like multi-layered systemic you know dynamics that are at play yeah yeah I think there is a, a tendency to like like whole communities kind of gaslight each other and like you know fuel the fire with each other one thing that I was thinking of from from what you were just saying about like the immigration trauma is that it seems like it's really this combination of like intergenerational trauma and then current reinforcements of that because like you know there's the 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 trauma that like your parents or grandparents or other ancestors have experienced being passed down in these kind of Mm -hmm. these messages and these um kind of like values and norms but then it's like if you if you have parents at home that are like you need to be perfect to fit in and you need to do this and you need to do that and then the kid goes to school it's like then that is just reinforced again by Mm -hmm. you know you can't eat your cultural food you can't have friends at your house so i think it it makes it very real that it's like it's not just something that your parents have experienced that they're passing down to you it's then it's something that you and your parents have both experienced but maybe just in different settings or or different ways yeah yeah and then I think about like you know just even how hard it is to like break out of that without like exploiting your own trauma you know we we think about like all of the um like our society loves a good like heartwarming story of the trauma survivor who then like achieves great things and overcomes and like you know when you add like kind of a racialized element to it and it's you know like how often do you hear this the situation like my mom couldn't tell me well I mean in Chinese culture Asian culture is very common like my parents couldn't tell me they love me but they cut me fruit and so like that's even kind of become a trope where like in order to um you know identify and recognize and begin talking about it like it's so hard to do that in a way that doesn't exploit it or like, you know, fall into the, a a whole different type of like systemic expectations and talk tracks of like what, you know, your trauma story should look like given other people who look like you. Right. Yeah. I feel like you hear that a lot of like the, the like immigration success story or like, it's kind of like inspiration porn. I've like heard it before where it's like, you know, whatever, my dad moved here and he couldn't even speak English and he couldn't even, you know, he, he didn't know anyone, but look at all this stuff he did and he built a business and now I'm going to law school. And yeah, it's like like, like bootstrapping. Yeah. Very like pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Mm -hmm. And like, that is a sign of like worth and value and like, um, Um, yeah, like very, I mean, very like capitalist, you know, ways of like judging Mm -hmm. people's value. Um, yeah, it's, it's such a, it's such a catch 22. And I think like, there is so much, like everything about racial justice work is dialectical. There is a tension between two opposing, um, simultaneous truths when it comes to like every element of it, like damned if you do, damned if you don't. So we just kind of have to feel our way through and like, you know, um, really plug into what feels authentic to ourselves as we're kind of discovering. Yeah, I I think like the most important thing in therapy, at least probably is just the validation piece, Mm -hmm. because 
like there are certain aspects of our culture and the world we live in that we can't change as individuals yet at least and that are just inherently traumatizing you know like there Mm -hmm. are just inherently traumatizing aspects of like how the world works and especially how the world treats like certain groups of people Mm -hmm. and so you know if if that can't always be like changed or controlled then at least it can be affirmed and and validated and I um I think just yeah even that essential piece is like missing in so much psychology like you were saying before about just kind of how it has been so like individualized and well what makes you feel that way and that sort of thing um and I I think you know at least in in my experience with therapy there's something inherently really powerful just about having someone like validate your experience Mm -hmm. and not try to pathologize or individualize Mm -hmm. you know the meaning that you're taking from it and just be like yeah like that really sucks and it's not fair and it did have this impact and um i would i would imagine that's a a big piece of just like the healing that people can attain where it's like even if these larger cultural issues can't be healed there can at least be healing in that kind of sense of having your experience you know legitimized and heard yeah i mean there's a lot of times where i will validate my clients fawning and like this is political this is survival and you got to do what you got to do but also recognize that you're doing it because you got to do it not because this is who you are or because you know, this is your truth forever. Like do this, get to the next step, get out of the situation and then like seek safety in a way that, you know, feels more true to who you are. Yeah. And, and, and I think that that really speaks to like the necessity of mental health professionals um, as advocates. Like we have to really advocate for some see change to this field and, you know, and it's to policy yeah. so that, like the system can also change, you know, alongside the ways that, you know, marginalized populations have had to change themselves. Forever. Yeah. 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 I, I wonder if there's also like um, a historical distrust between different groups and psychology as oh, a field absolutely. because of all the like abuse that's happened in the field, right? Yeah. Abuse, power differentials, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a feel rooted in like white old men, you know, (laughs) and it's, you know, and I think like that is why it can be really affirming for my clients to like, Oh, you're not that prototype that I think of when I think of a psychologist, Um, you know, but you know, from a policy level, like it really speaks to like, what are we doing to recruit more clinicians of color? There's so much gatekeeping that happens, you know, in academics and academia. Um, and even like this idea of like, what is professional, what is considered like, you know, good work on, on this like scholarly level is all so steeped in white supremacy. So like this change has to be, you know, cultivated at every single level, you know, right from like recruitment, how do you get people interested in this field so that more, you know, people of color apply to be clinicians. Yeah, yeah. And the education that therapists receive, right? Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm in my program is a social work program. So I think they they vary a lot. And um, I I chose the program that I'm in because they talked a lot about like justice and Mm -hmm. anti oppression work. Um, And because it's social work, there's kind of like a whole part of it that's focused on like policy and advocacy and stuff. So there's been those pieces. But I've heard from other people who took more traditional like counseling, you know, therapy uh, programs that there was barely any emphasis on things like racism or oppression or and I mean, even my program, I have like plenty of complaints about too. So like, or I mean, the fact that so many therapists don't know about trauma really is one of my Mm -hmm. biggest like pet peeves the amount of people who will like comment on my stuff and be like yeah my parent my therapist like doesn't even know what complex trauma is or you know it's It's like all trauma yeah (laughs) yeah yeah yeah, for sure yeah and I and I think about like how you know when you kind of go from it from this like very like like broad stroke justice orientation you can create people who are like very much um like in tune with the mission, but then they get, they kind of get lost in the weeds of like, how does this apply to you, you know? And like, every, it's, it's a natural response to be like kind of defensive when, you know, your fragility is called out or, but like, it's, it's like, there's, it's so hard to hit it at all the levels, you know, you can be very much like, yes, social justice from this like policy perspective, but then like someone says like, well, that's a microaggression. And you're like, <laughs> 
Whoa. Uh, you know, like, no, I, I can't, I'm not racist. I can't be racist. Yeah. You know, so it's just, it's, uh, it's, there's, yeah, that dialectical tension just exists. Yeah. 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 Okay. My, my last question or my, my last two questions, because mm-hmm. I just thought of another one are, um, what would be your, your words of advice for anyone listening to this episode who is like relating and is like, oh, I totally like have that kind of oppression based trauma or I, I relate mm-hmm. to like things that are said. What, what would just be your, um, advice to them for resources they can seek out yeah. or just anything else you would want to say to them? Um, don't give up, you know, interview your therapist, like you are going on first dates, like, <laughs> you know, most therapists offer like a 15, 20 minute phone call, um, and really ask them the hard questions that that's your opportunity. Um, there are more and more therapists who are justice oriented out there who are like seeking this this training and um, this perspective out. Um, you know, there's some great therapist directories. I love inclusive therapists because they do a great job at vetting um, all of the people that they list for their own anti-racism work and their own identity work. Um, and you know, and, and if you're thinking of becoming a therapist, like, and this is something that's on your radar and, and something that really appeals to you, please do. Um, there's scholarships, there's, um, you know, just different types of programs that can make this more affordable. Um, and I, I think like the more awareness we can bring to this as even like a, an orientation, um, an approach to therapy, the, the better like people will be, you know, uh, more broadly, like every person is a has a cultural story yeah so yeah and I mean I I think we we don't talk as much about how like white supremacy also really hurts white bodies too so you know if you are working from a justice orientation like that's all taken into consideration yeah yeah um yeah I think like there's probably so many people that are dissuaded from becoming therapists even if they're interested in mental health because Mm -hmm. the image of therapy is so like old white man and maybe because of their own bad experiences with like psychology Mm -hmm. so I think yeah it's it's good to know that like the field is moving in this direction and that there is you know ample opportunity for um different people's voices to be valued Mm -hmm. and to be like meaningful in the field of psychology yeah absolutely it's it's encouraging for me (laughs) (laughs) yeah for me too yeah Mm -hmm. um okay my last question is do you have any reading recommendations for me or other people um, I think my favorite book on healing racial trauma is My Grandmother's Hands by Resma Menachem. You know, there's also, he's also been on some podcasts, so you can kind of get an intro to his work. He's um, a somatic experiencing practitioner. So he really talks about it from this body perspective that in order to heal like societal cognitive trauma, we have to heal from a body level first. And he kind of inter- integrates like neuroscience and epigenetics into the healing work of racial trauma. Um, Let me think. Yeah, that's like probably- I've heard that one recommended before. I need to read that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's see, let's see. Um, I mean, there's a lot of just really great like anti-oppressive, anti-racist, you know, books that help people do their own identity work. Like, um, me and white supremacy is a great one. Um, it's got a lot of journaling prompts. What is it? Me and white supremacy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, let me look at my, <laughs> my bookshelf here. Um, how to be an anti-racist. Also a good one. Um, I think of the ones that are, um, really take into account these two two things together i'm sure i'll think of more i'll yeah, I'll, 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 I'll send you them if i think of more but i would say like good. yeah me my grandmother's hands prop is like definitely the best one yeah that i can think of you know yeah awesome cool i'll um i'll add those in like a blurb under the video yeah. so people can check them out if they want Cool. Well, I think that is all the all the questions that I have planned out. So thank you so much for sharing, uh, for sharing and having this conversation with me. Super interesting and important. And I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. And yeah, I can't wait to hear it and, and send me, send me it when it's out.